listening to this art talk with Federal Lizeth. I'm Sara Guzman. Um, I'm a third year here at UCSD, and I'm one of the uh, the Joy de la Cruz Art and Activism interns at the Cross Cultural Center. Before we start off, I'm going to start off with the land acknowledgement. The UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our, where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We are honored to share this space with them and we thank them for their stewardship. This was adapted from the UCSD Intertribal Resource Center and I really recommend that y'all look into whose land you're currently occupying. Um, a little about Bedela. She is a queer Nicaraguan and Italian film photographer that was raised here in SD. Bedela offers a unique perspective to the livelihood that radiates within this community. Her photography com comes with the intention to tell a story and, ab and above all, celebrate the hustle of life. Um, that's her Instagram and her website, which um, we'll show again later on in the presentation in case you want to check out her work. And I'll pass it on to Philip. Hi, guys. I wanted to thank you guys for um, joining. This is a very exciting thing for me, and I hope that you guys are pleased with what I have to share. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Thank you, Sarah, for the land acknowledgement and the introduction. One second. Let's get up here. Okay. So again, my name is Fidela Lise. Um, I will be showcasing San Diego's distinctive culture through photography. Um, again, I'm Fidela Lisette. My pronouns are she slash her. I am a queer Nicoya Italiana woman. Um, Nicoya also means Nicaraguan, which is a Nicaragua is a country in Central America. And I'm also Italian. Uh, I was born and raised here in the 619. And if you don't know what the 619 means, it's just uh, it's synonymous to being from San Diego because 619 is our area code. So I wanted to introduce myself with these four photos to kind of give you guys the feel of uh, what I shoot and kind of what I like to capture. Um, so the first photo on our left with the brown convert, um, I wanted to show this photo to kind of explain uh, San Diego's style in a way. I feel I was raised with uh, the shoe itself, a, a high top converse being a significant mark in our style. Um, you either had to lace, lace up your high tops all the way, or if you had a low top, you had to put fat shoelaces in it. And I feel like that's not something everybody can understand, but at least for people who are from the community I'm from know that this is just um, ethics. So this photo is very important and you will see along the way just um, Kind of the unique style and stilo of San Diego. And the photo on the middle top is of the Coronado Bridge taken from a community called Sherman Heights, which is a predominantly black and brown community. Um, and then across the Coronado Bridge is a very wealthy community um, known as uh, Coronado. So I wanted to bring this photo to attention to show also you know, the city that we're in, San Diego, if, if y'all are, um, but also to show how this bridge um, is one, a fascination to many members of San Diego and many members outside of San Diego. Um, I, growing up, knowing that we had such a beautiful bridge and honestly, the only bridge I believe we have in uh, San Diego, um, I always felt really proud about it because I did like that maybe other cities such as uh, San Francisco had the Golden Gate Bridge. And so it felt really nice of our own. Um, but also there's another side to it where uh, this bridge sort of plays the role of being a border it's from the mainland to this man-made land of Coronado. 
And not only does it do that, but it also separates um, the poor community from the wealthier community. And the bridge itself is inaccessible to pedestrians. So only people with cars are able to cross. Um, and that in itself is a privilege to have a car. So it kind of just creates a little, it, it uh, acts as a distinctive barrier between um, these predominantly black and brown communities on the mainland and the wealthier on the other side of it. And moving on to the photo on the bottom in the middle are three lowriders. And I wanted to bring up this photo because um, I have been around lowriding culture just simply by growing up here in San Diego and I will get more into that later. Um, and then as of recently, I have begun photographing lowriders more and more. It's become another fascination of mine. And now I have family um, who are participants of this lifestyle. And so it has become um, an even more uh, factor into my life. And lastly, the photo on the right is of my friend Jesse holding up his left fist um, in front of his Chevy truck in Barrio Logan. And I wanted to bring this photo to attention because um, he's very much uh, a community member and I don't, I don't hire models. I don't, uh, you know, I don't seek sp uh, specific people to photograph. I become friends with people. I wanna capture them in the way that they are. And so I met him um, uh, at the job that I work at, which is a cafe and we became friends instantaneously. And he's actually uh, one of the main leaders in the Chicano Park Steering Committee. And the steering committee um, facilitates really what goes on in Chicano Park. So um, I just wanted to kind of share that I'm very much about my community. I very much about documenting, you know, the people around me rather than seeking out uh, certain faces to uh, model San Diego, if that makes any sense. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So then I wanted to talk about my process. Um, I included these two photos to kind of show the different things that I can do. Uh, the first photo or the photo on the right is me um, photographing a couple for their engagement photos. And this is really what um, I'm really about and how I photograph anybody or anything. I, you know, will just pull up with my camera and a few film rolls and just go at it. And it's important to me to um, use what's around me. And instead of me, um, instead of me controlling the environment around me, I, I like it to kind of force me to become accustomed to it. So like here on this land, I had to figure out how the land works and you know what was comfortable um, for the couple and for us and where we could shoot rather than manipulating it. And um, so that's kind of how I shoot. I have yet to indulge in studio photography. I'd like to soon, but a big factor with uh, in my work is just being able to go outside and see what I can do with what's already around me. And, um, and with that, I feel that I am respecting more of my environment. And the photo on my left is me taking a, a product shot of this book named La Tierra Mia that I was featured in fortunately. And so it, this photo is to kind of introduce also, I'm willing to take this route um, if asked, it's never a problem. It, it actually pushes me to, you know, figure out what film is right um, to work with lighting, which I don't very much. I actually just end up chasing the sun since I'm outside um, and things like that. So I did want to show that uh, I can very much do this. I like it and, um, and it pushes me out of my comfort zone and trying to figure out everything for this one thing. So with that, I wanted to introduce um, my, my photos and the difference between my candid photos and my more um, assessed photos. So this photo is a candid photo. Um, I, it took me three seconds to realize that this needed to be taken, two seconds to take the photo and then walk away right after into the house because we were right outside my mom's house. Um, and so this is a candid photo of my younger sister. Um, it was important to me to capture our family's apartment complex behind us because it has played a significant role in our lives, this home specifically. Uh, we 
currently are in City Heights, and City Heights is uh, is a popular community filled with different backgrounds because it has a large population of immigrants. Um, so after moving around a lot within my childhood, City Heights has become uh, the place that has provided me and my family stability. And so when I saw my sister this day, um, obviously I thought she looked good and I liked that we were outside and I just felt it was right to capture her in our safe space. Next, we have a photo of my friend, Billy Berger. I had, I think, five, five frames left on my roll and knowing how ecstatic he is and uh, just his character, I knew he'd be down if I asked him, hey, can I finish this roll with you? And so he said, yeah, and I'd come running out with my camera, snap this photo firsthand before he started getting up uh, before he started posing and getting really serious. And I just felt that this photo really captures his charismatic or his charismatic self um, with his smile and his hands. This man is full of stories and I only know so little. And um, I also understand that a lot of other people know him, but also know just one kind of one part of him too. So this picture is really important to me because I feel this um, generalizes really what the man Billy Berger is about. And so now moving on to a more posed photo. Um, this shoot I was, I, I was booked for, so I was asked to do this photo shoot for my friend uh, for her birthday. And so this was more posed. I directed her a little bit as to you know where to look, how to sit. Um, also, I took into account uh, the lamp shade or the lamps hanging over her. Um, the greenery behind her and on the couch and how that worked with her beautiful, excuse me, her beautiful red hair. So here's just one example of the portraits I take with a more directed focus, less spontaneous, just really trying to capture the beauty of her and the essence of her for her birthday and for myself and, you know, make sure that it's aesthetically pleasing all around. Next, we have another more structured photo. Um, while the day to get to this photo was very spontaneous, this photo itself I very much directed because I noticed the shadowing of her of the branches onto her body and really loved how it looked on her all white um, on her white uh, dressing and her skin, her bare skin. So that was definitely put into place. What also was important to me was the little tiny dot, if you can notice. Uh, between her face and her arm, and that is the moon, and I have an admiration for the moon. Um, so I really like that I was able to capture that in between there and have her body frame the moon and have the branches shadow her over and sort of frame her as well while she looks off into the distance into the last bit of sunlight that was available to us. And then here's another posed photo. This photo is interesting to me because while it is posed and this was also a shoot I was booked for, um, we still got vital elements of San Diego and um, what it's about. And, you know, growing up for me, like the liquor store is, was like equivalent to going to the amusement park. Um, if my mom or Thea handed me $5 to make it work with me and my cousins, we were super excited and we would go to the liquor store and, you know, try as hard as we can to get everybody something. And it was like the best time. Um, so it's important to me to have v and market behind us because it kind of like illustrates just how um, important these liquor stores meant and how important they are to the community um, for everyday things that we need. While also the street sign, Samson and Ocean View is a very popular street corner. It has a um, very um, old buildings and an old laundromat that's significant to Barrio Logan's community, um, which I thought was important to recognize. And yeah, move forward to the next. So now I wanted to, to talk about where I started because it is very important to um, recognize that the beginning of anything is probably rough until you continue to go, until you continue and you learn and you talk to people and you just keep trying. But in the beginning, there was battery acid. And I say that because the first camera that I picked up was from a thrift store. 
and I knew nothing. I just knew that um, 35 millimeter film existed and I liked taking photos and I saw the camera and was like, let me just get in, you know, figure it out. And so I bought um, and I took it immediately after to a camera store. And they explained to me that the camera I just bought for $45 was uh, not able to function because it was covered in battery acid. So that was a huge learning, learning lesson, but how was I supposed to know? I had no idea what battery acid even looked like on a, on a camera. I had no idea what I even like just invested in, but I kept investing. So I ended up buying the, a new body for that camera. I kept the lens and I just started. And so I learned how to wind film in, they taught me there and I just went for it. But what I didn't know yet was, you know, how to uh, control my shutter speed and aperture and what ISO meant for film. I just popped the film in and took a photo and felt I was doing something great, which I was because I wouldn't be here if I wasn't doing something great. Um, but these two photo, these two photos, excuse me, are very overexposed photos. Um, they definitely could have been done better, but either way, they remind me of just where I started and you know how much I really wanted to do this. And I have a strong adoration for these photos. So, so then I um, started learning. As you can see, these are way different um, than the last two photos. I started learning. I started you know having conversations with people who also had cameras. I started talking more to uh, people who worked in camera stores that I would go to and just ask all the questions I could because I realized I really, really wanted to do this and I had no problem in investing my time or money into doing a film photography. So then I started uh, just taking photos wherever I was of, of my friends, of the street, of you know, cute babies at a low writing event. And just started really exploring what it is, what it was that I liked to photograph, and it turned out to be, you know, just community members, um, my everyday life, and also uh, the the importance of color. And so, in the middle photo, this was kind of the first introduction to me that I really valued color therapy. And so, I look at this photo and just think about how, like, the the faded greens and the faded yellows, and then that bright red car that just peeks in, really are just pleasing for me to look at. And so I started to kind of focus my attention onto uh, things that were more colorful, things that were essentially color therapy to me and later found out that they're color therapy to my viewers. And moving uh, forward with photographing my friends, I, I, they were basically, they are still basically the people that I experiment on. And of course they were down to support me. So we have like my friend Daphne on the left in front of the writer on Chicano Park Day. And um, knowing her hair matches the car, I was like, kneel down, let's go, let's take this picture. And we did. And actually this picture was featured on La Tierra Mia, which we will talk about later. Then on the right, I had my friend Robert, he was uh, visiting town. Um, we just walked around downtown, got uh, getting to know what buildings were available, just having fun, saw this building, and just immediately took the photo. And this photo is uh, interesting to me because it, to me, it looks a little bit more editorial. It's more, way more posed. And I actually have never taken a photo of someone like this before this one. And so uh, it, it was really fun to to do this and to take this photo, it kind of made me realize also that I have a interest in taking maybe photos for like fashion photography, et cetera, et cetera, just because of his structure and how straight he is and the shadowing and the use of the street element of the cone and the chipped wall that very much uh, was in a dirty parking lot, but you wouldn't be able to tell. And here are some new photo or um, some other photos showing how I would just walk around, take photos of community members. Um, this kid, Chino, he just bought new tires for his lowrider bike, which is a very, which is a big move and was exciting. They're white walls, they're cool. So I took a photo of him. Um, and then on the right was when I was starting to explore taking photos of lowriders. This uh, because I work in Logan and lived in Logan for a short amount of time, 
Uh, Lowriders are always around, especially in the summer, that's the season for them. Uh, so I started to kind of just um, walk around and a lot of these would just pop up, post up. And I asked, you know, the owners if I could take a photo of them and try to figure out just what I like to capture about these um, beautiful, beautiful cars. And so that led me to Chicano Park Day on 2019, in 2019. And I have to say that this Chicano Park Day is one of the most important Chicano Park Days because nobody knew that this would be the last one. Um, and so we haven't had one for two years now. And Chicano Park Day in San Diego is, is a main holiday, uh, at least for the Latino and Black community. It is next to Christmas. And so everybody shows up and shows out on Chicano Park Day. And if, for those of you who don't know what Chicano Park Day is, um, it is a day, April 20th, that celebrates the uh, barrio lobe in the community because in the 70s, this, very co this community fought against displacement and racial injustice when um, the, Cal the state of California tried to build um, a freeway over homes, essentially. And so this day is all about celebrating and resiliency and providing and just being there with the community and you know, just celebrating our existence because at one point and at many points still, and who knows for how long, uh, we our existence is always threatened. And so this is when I started to get more comfortable with shooting because I would ask um, random people if I could take photos of them or their super cute baby who was adorned with these conchas hanging and her bows and this beautiful carriage. Um, so this is when I got really comfortable. And also um, behind her is a woman in, in a beautiful gown in a flower headdress. And then there's a mural framing them on. So I thought this was an important photo to show to just show kind of uh, how celebrative Mexican culture is here in San Diego and how Chicano Park Day really just lets brown people be exactly who they are and celebrate their culture without fearing harm. And I also started to get more familiar with lowriders being able to you know, explore more. And so this photo I took right under the Coronado Bridge and the sun peeked right through the bridge to where it made this yellow Impala look golden. So I always look at this Impala and always think about the sun and that this Impala is the sun. Um, so this was also a photo that inspired me to continue wanting to focus on lowriders. And then we have this photo of a couple um, I was just walking through the park, looking at all the boots and saw this couple shopping, minding their business, but I thought they looked so cool to me. Um, a lot of people in Chicano Park Day dress up or don't, it, but this couple just really stood up, to, stood out to me. And so I, I nervously went behind them and tapped on their shoulder and asked if I could take a photo of them. And they said, yes. And so I took this photo and to this day, it's just a beautiful photo to look at for me. And, you know, it, gives, it makes me miss, obviously, what Chicano Park Day was and just who would come out and, you know, the beauty of all the people and all the brown and black faces that we would see. And that photo is actually behind me, um, but we'll talk about later why that photo is behind me. And so more into low writing culture, I, um, there was an end of summer cruise in August of 2019. And this was also one of the, the last um, low riding events because um, like I said, low rider culture or the low riding season essentially is in the summer. When winter hits, that's when everybody starts working on their cars and then spring hits and we start getting back into it. So this was the end of summer cruise at the Embarcadero. And these photos show more of mural work on low riders and I wanted to bring these to attention because low riding culture is not only about, uh, you know, pretty cars, cool colors, all those things, but it is a lot about preserving stories and storytelling and, you know, um, religious iconography. We can see that there's like a Quetzalcoatl on the bottom or the, sc the skull, a woman. So it's all about paying attention to detail. Um, 
that add to the influences of Mexican culture. And so this photo on the left shows that as well. We have the Aztec calendar. Um, we have a baby adorned in traditional wear and almost, almost a statue, a little bit cut off um, on the right of her. And yeah, and then on this side is the same car, just the front of it. I get the idea of like how, average, how quote unquote average this car looked. And if you look deeper into it, you see that there is a narrative within that car. And also, uh, it, it's important to me to document the people that are there. Um, and while Chicanismo and low writing culture is, um, low writing culture is originally uh, started by Black people and is still influenced by Black culture 100%. In San Diego, there is more of a, a Mexic uh, Mexican presence within that culture, a Chicano presence within that culture. Um, but also there is still Central American presence here too. So the photo on the left um, is a tattoo saying Pinolero. And so Pinolero is a, sl a slang term for Nicaraguan. Um, so just kind of to show visibility for Central Americans and anybody else um, who's in low writing culture that, you know, it does not maybe identify as Chicano, but identifies as Pinolero. And then on the right, we do have a Chicano man um, kneeling with, with the car. And then lastly, this photo is also from the event in front of um, downtown, um, aligned with the two buildings. And this is just to remind us that this is in San Diego and this exists. And if you haven't, um, you know, come on the end of summer cruise will also happen this year at the same place. So keep a look up. So moving forward, I wanted to talk about my transition from color photography to black and white photography. And not that I don't do color photography anymore, but as soon as I indulged in black and white and um, learned more about it, it acted as a different way to preserve um, life. It, it just becomes suddenly much more ancient and much, much more sacred um, than color. It's just my... So because I enjoy taking portraits, taking them in black and white just changed the game for me. Um, again, it feels sacred. It feels like these, these photos are words written in a book. Like I'm looking at this photo on the left and it's a woman holding a gun on her lap and someone uh, playing the guitar behind her possibly singing and you know her beautiful profile just looking off into the distance. It's, it makes it makes you draw conclusions as to maybe what she's thinking, what's going on, um, you know, the essence of her beauty, her her gown, um, the poncho, the hands, like everything, everything about it. I feel like black and white photography really, the contrast between black and white really highlights uh, the more important details in people's faces and their presentation, which I really value and respect. And so, um, the photo on my right was one of my earliest photos taken in black and white. This was actually when I attempted to take a black uh, intro introduction to film class. Um, this was two months before COVID, so I did finish the class, but it made me really pay attention to detail. I had to really learn what I wanted my light, the sun to, to highlight on, say, um, my friend's face and the dog's face. And so I really like that the sun goes directly across uh, the boy's eyes and the dog's eyes and uh, leaves kind of everything else up to darkness. And also that they are both looking the same way, again, leaves you to think like what, what's going on or you know what is the context? I think black and white just draws you in 10 times more than color does because you have to it kind of removes you from reality and you have to think twice about what you're looking at rather than um, how we see things in color. Um, and so everything just kind of passes us by without really paying attention to detail. And so more about uh, portraits that I take. The one on the left is of my brother. Um, and so this is also taken in my family's uh, apartment complex. This is on his birthday. Um, and I. I just got him that actually that bunch of for his birthday. And so I was like, put it on, I gotta see. And he comes out and immediately the bars are 
you know, blocking his face, but the bars behind us of the gate are blocking his face, but leaving that small little slither of light onto his nose. And I really liked how it looked and how all of this looked and had to take this picture. And um, quite honestly, this picture would not have been the same if it weren't. It's, I think it's might be one of my favorite photos um, up to date. And then on the right is a photo of a man at a car shop that I was at one time. And funny thing about him is that um, I went to this car shop because I lived close by and I needed something done. And I realized that I had taken a photo of his dog uh, months before as I was taking a walk. And so I told him, I was like, hey, I have a picture of your dog. Do you want it? Do you want to see it? And he's like really confused and probably felt really weird that I had a picture of his dog. But he was like, yeah, let me see it. And so I showed him. And then he brings me to the back of the car shop and she has her own little pen. And she, he introduces me to the pit bull and I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> this is the dog. And so anyways, it was that small act of like, uh, we just kind of created a, like a, like a small little friendship for the day because we recognize each other. It wasn't just business. It was a conversation. It was like, hey, I have a picture of your dog. This might sound weird. And then you know, we just kind of looked at each other more than just like, hey, I need something done with my car. I got to go. Um, and so that's what I really want to bring into my photography is that I value these conversations where I can uh, come up to somebody and get to know them at least for three seconds, get to know their dog for four seconds. And, um, you know, before I take the picture, because I'd, I'd rather do that and just uh, invade somebody's, you know, privacy or, or again, just walk by each other. So I asked him if I could take a photo of him in front of this truck. I have a big fascination for Chevy trucks. And um, so I, he let me and I took this photo. And so this photo has become a very important uh, photo to me because of what was behind it. And then also more into candid photography and then putting that together, bridging that with black and white, then you just get a beautiful movie in one picture. So, for me on the left, uh, there's a handshake going on and there's a young girl in the passenger seat fulfilling that handshake. And then there's her mom smiling over at me. And like this, this, um, this photo is just important to me because I caught the moment right then and there. And I don't know what it is about this handshake. I think that um, at least here, like in San Diego, if you, introduce yourself with a handshake you know that they're homies you know that they're family and it just it's just a certain bond that you have and um and while this this role specifically I did I think I did not shoot well because um it you know as the artist you look at your art and you're like ah this is wrong this is wrong but this photo I will always love and really presented itself well and then the photo on the right is also a beautiful smile captured in black and white, highlighted with the white. Um, and again, just another example of just how black and white photography preserves that moment um, really well and, and either exuberates happiness or sadness or both, or you know, family on the left or friendship on the left and excitement on the right, laughter. Um, so I just really, appreciate black and white photography for doing this and a little bit more portraits on this on the left we have my brother and in front of his um his lowrider bike which he built from the ground up built in our dad's garage and he's wearing a tribal windbreaker his san diego cap and this is another photo um illustrating just san diego's swagger and our style and what's important to us I'm actually wearing a tribal shirt right now, not on purpose, but that's just what it is. And on the right, we have my younger sister. Um, and this one is important to me because I wanted to showcase also the swagger. She's wearing a pro club, which is a popular brand, at least for us. Um, she's wearing pro club sweats. You wanna be adorned, adorned in, these, in these brands. These are brands that are in shirt department stores that are basically only in poor communities. We'd go here for our uniforms, we'd go here for everyday wear. Pro clubs was our, is our thing. Um, where Because we couldn't afford clothes in the mall. Um, I, I'm not really even 
aware of what brands would be better at the moment because I've just always stuck to, you know, what I know, what made me feel at home going to these places like Fanmar or Price Breakers. If any of you guys recognize Mario's, um, going there with my with my family, you know, being super excited over a crispy pro club or some new Dickies, et cetera, et cetera. And then I also just wanted to showcase, you know, the youth in this photo where she gives you a hard look. Um, a hard stare, but she very much is a very young person. She looks young. Um, and so kind of just to show how a lot of us here in San Diego are built and how we're grown, we're grown to be strong, to be um, headstrong, to, you know, be brave and hold our heads high no matter what, no matter how small we are. And again, just kind of like coinciding with the hustle of life that we've, uh, that we've been accustomed to here. And so black and white photography also um, details really well with these elements. So on the left, we have a saguaro cactus. Obviously a saguaro cactus is not, um, are not from San Diego. This was taken in Arizona, but I really, really love this photo because it shows the cactus as sort of godly. It's the God in this photo. It's, it's towering over me, over the camera. Um, the moon is so, so small next to it. Um, and so, again, with the last bit of sunlight, I was able to grab, to capture this cactus in its most powerful moment, I think. And then on the right, we have um, the interior of a lowrider with the chandelier, which is something really cool. I, mean, I haven't seen something like that until this. But also what was important to me capturing it is, um, so we have the chandelier, but in the sunroof is a palm tree framed. And I just feel, I just really liked how those two elements came together and looked. Um, and, and then like the low rider in the, in the corner, just the essence of this whole photo, I really enjoyed. And so a very important aspect of my photography is also kind of always insinuating a message and, um, and, sort of implementing, I am a political person and I like to implement that as much as I can in my photo. So this photo was taken in Nogales, um, Sonora, Mexico, um, along the border. This was a installation that had no other way of um, identifying it other than what's presented here of these everyday faces some smiling, some serious, some smirking, um, right in front of the border. And so this photo is important to me because it, it really humanizes the border. San Diego is a border town. We are 20 minutes away from it, some even two minutes away from it, close to the border. And our border is the most militarized, I believe. Uh, it's just a very intense space. It's a very intense space. And, I feel it's very easy for us, you know, out of stress and out of fear to unacknowledge just how much the border is weaponized, um, even being 20 minutes away. I think, at least for myself, I can take accountability for maybe not thinking so much of, of what this border does to families on a daily basis. And it's important for me to be aware of what it does. And so when I saw this, um, you know, just these, these human faces, these were, these were it looked like they were like clay was placed on um, these people's faces and and it just makes it more real just the border isn't just a, a wall it's it displaces families it separates it separates people from feeling emotion from um from knowing how to survive or from surviving it just it plays a much bigger role, role than i think we have learned to um, normalize if that makes sense so I started focusing a lot on this because I, um, I, did not, I do not cross often. I do not cross often. I don't have family or I don't have any sort of reasons to be in Mexico so often, but I know a lot of people that do. And it is a struggle to either cross every day or maybe not to be able to cross one day and you, you, know, you miss school. You miss out on an important opportunity to thrive because of this, you know, this weapon. So I just wanted to kind of show um, what it's like. So the photo 
on the left is me on the U.S. side, and you can't even get, you know, five feet within the border wall at this point, and it's barbed wired up completely. It's just really impossible to, you know, even get close to it. And then we have the photo on the top, uh, in the middle on the top, and I'm back on the Mexico side, and and it just shows the difference of, you know, there's no barbed wire there, just a canyon and anybody can climb up. Um, you can't see in this picture, but there was a lot of graffiti and mural paintings on this border, you know, calling for help or, you know, just trying to really make this ugly thing a beautiful thing. And on the bottom, we just have a little bit more of like what's around the border. What stuck out to me here is no mas muerte, because like I said, the border is a weapon and it does, it does kill. And so lastly, back on the US side, I wanted to include this photo because not only does it does the border separate families, it it removes us from feeling, from being able to love. And love is a big part in all of us. We have to love in order to function, either whether it's ourselves or anybody else or whatever else is around us, our pets, et cetera, et cetera. And so this. When I was exploring the border, this is actually Valentine's Day um, this year. And so um, I noticed a few people going up to the border wall and talking to their families on the other side. And it was such a sad sight to see because they couldn't be there with them on Valentine's Day and express their love with them, you know, to just like feel them, to, to feel their presence without this huge thing in the way. And so when I went back to the US side, um, I saw a man um, basically putting his whole body onto that wall, talking to what I could assume was his lover on the other side. And just the fact that he was just fully trying to embrace the border, trying to get closer to her. And look to my right, and there's a store with wedding gowns in it, you know, advertising love, go get married, buy this wedding dress. And I just thought it was a very twisted dynamic of what was going on around me and what I was seeing um, and just how capitalized that was and, and what the reality is in the corner. Um, this man trying as much as possible to get close to his lover through the border wall. So, yeah. So with that, I wanted to get into this project that I did um, about Goya. For those of you that don't know, Goya is a food brand that is typically found in uh, uh, Latino markets. Um, it lets us have, it sells products that you wouldn't find in a typical US Ameri like American grocery store because um, Central and Central, Mexican, Central and South American cuisine is not always available here in the States, but Goya was able to do that for us. But Goya has not been a nice corporation to the very community it represents. So I made this project titled, If It's Goya, It Has to Be Mierda. Goya Foods has played a significant role in many people's lives with, within the Latino community here in the US. Having a Central American background, for me to be able to go to the grocery store and recognize foods that my family would cook at home on shelves under the Goya label provided me a sense of inclusion and identity. It is no secret that Goya has played a significant role in Latino families here in the US when it comes to preserving our cultural traditions through food. However, Goya Foods has proven for decades that they in fact do not and will not show up for the very community it has built its business on. With already a few boycotts having been enacted throughout the years, dating back to Miami in 1997, where workers were in protest demanding better working conditions, to very recently in 2020, when CEO Robert Unanue emerged as a Trump backer, knowing the very harm he has imposed onto the Latin community during his presidential residency. Soon after, Ivanka Trump had shared a photo, not shared, advertising Goya Foods and their mission statement, if it's Goya, it has to be good. While Goya as a food still plays a huge part in the integration of Latino foods in the US, I cannot turn my head away from the blatant disrespect it has portrayed as a corporation towards the Latino community. 
This photographic series, created and directed by me, lives as a testament to disrespecting Goya the same way it has to my community, because if it's Goya, it has to be mierda. I, so, I loved Goya. I loved Goya. I loved that I would be able to go in the grocery store and, you know, see things that my, that my abuelos would make and be really excited because, like, oh, cool, I can make that. I can make that now. Um, but given what I've just shared, it's no longer something that I want to support because they don't support me or my community. So this photo, these photos are all about um, this man disrespecting Goya the same way that he has disrespected us. So we have here on the left, you know, him considering the Goya can, looking at the camera, just, you know, what is this? What do we got here? And he opens it and he realizes just how stinky it is. These frijoles are bad. These are not good beans. So he spits them out too, because after trying them, they're at, he finds out that they're absolutely distasteful and and he just kind of continues to disrespect it. He's gargling in his mouth, spits it out again, spits it up in the air, you know, plays with the food, um, really just kind of making sure that it just loses more, all more of its worth. And so we kind of try to um, make a sort of borracho pick of him just like spilling the beans um, and, you know, just really looking really disgusted by what Goya beans are made of and how they taste and throwing it all around and just putting so much anger and distaste in it because it's a bad bean. And so um, this, this series was very much made to just, you know, disrespect Goya and to show that these beans are not good. They're not good. So don't buy them. They taste bad. Don't cook them. Doesn't help. And now I wanted to move to uh, an important book that I was able to be a part of. This book is the first book that I have been published in as a photographer. So this book means a lot to me. Also, it means a lot to the community um, in Barrio Logan and the community of Chico. La Tierra Mía is, um, one second, La Tierra Mía is a Chicano Park story that catalogs a collection of memories through photos and notes from contributors who have shared a connection to the park for over the past 50 years. Hopefully though, hopefully through these shared artifacts, we can start to formulate a story of not only the past, but the maintenance of history for the future. This statement comes from Bob Dominguez, the author of La Tierra Mía and a close friend um, now. So La Tierra Mía, is a book that was able to, you know, incorporate archive photos of Chicano Park and depict what, how Chicano Park was built and the revolution through that and leads us into more a contemporary setting that include my photos and four other great photographers' photos of Chicano Park today. And this was um, such a blessing to be a part of and, um, to, and for the community as well. So um, you can purchase the, the first edition is sold out, but he did just release a second edition. If you'd like to know more about it, you can go to the website, latieramiabook.com um, and purchase the second edition. Also, I'd like to state that a lot of the photos that I've showed y'all before um, about Chicano Park are included in that book. And that is also why this one is big and blown up. This is an original gallery piece that was featured in the, um, the book opening. And so lastly, if you guys would like to keep up with my work or look at more, you can find me at my website, fidelalicet.com, um, or you could keep up with me on Instagram or email me if you have any questions or um, just anything you want to share. Um, my email, fidelalicetphoto at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching and allowing me to uh, share my work. It really means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you, Fidela. And now we'll move on to Q&A for folks that have any questions. Um, if we could please change the slide just to see the question. Uh, Y'all can go ahead and use the Q&A or even the chat to ask any questions that y'all might have for Fidela. Um, a question that I have for you is, 
what about the community that you document inspires you to create art? I think that it's it's like the the livelihood um, within the community. San Diego is a very beautiful city and is a very um, colorful city. There's so many different people here with so many different backgrounds, but yet everywhere I go, we all kind of share that same mentality of being welcoming, being kind, and um, and you know, we just kind of have this this kind of flow within us throughout this whole city that really makes me feel at home and really makes me want to capture that photography. And so that's really what a uh, what inspires me is just like our our kindness and our like the familiar standard that we all hold between us. Thank you. Um, and my second question is, most of your work is based off of portraits of other people. Uh, did the pandemic cause you to like have to change the focus of your art? Like, did you have to find like other, I guess, subjects for your photography? Yeah, yeah. I um, So as I mentioned before, I was barely getting into the first photography class that I would have ever taken. I was only two months in and I just learned how to develop on my own. Um, and then COVID hit and then school became hard. And, you know, trying to do a lab class on Zoom with film um, and I, me having no resources around me to develop, et cetera, I, I couldn't do it. And so for a while, I just didn't do it because not even the photo stores were open um, to even develop film if I wanted to shoot. So it was very hard because it was something that I loved to do. and. I did stop for a little bit, but um, at a little, a few weeks in, I would say, um, I just started to really think about what I could do at this moment, what I could. And so I started to drive around my city and I started to actually take photos through the car window. And I did that a lot. I would just pull up and um, just stay in my car, you know, be safe, but just take photos of like University Avenue of Popular Street in San Diego and like, I did a whole series on it actually, and uh, people really enjoyed it. And I just, you know, I stuck to that and I really liked it. Um, and it also challenged me to, since I was at home, it challenged me to focus more on at home and to appreciate it more because I feel that before COVID, I really was not appreciating my home as much. I was always out, you know, at school or at work and, you know, I'm never trying to be home, but we were forced to be home. I had to become more comfortable with that. And a big part of why I wasn't is because, again, it was an apartment. It's, uh, I grew up in apartments. I don't really like to be in, in small spaces. I like to be, I like to explore as much as I can. Um, but, you know, COVID hit and I had to stay home. And so I also did a series on uh, my family and our apartment and just how safe it started to feel for me and for us and how much now I love, I love staying. I love being at home and enjoying what we have and the roof over our heads much more than before. It definitely also made me appreciate being at home a lot more too. Um, and my last question before we get started on the Q&A like from the audience is, why is it so important for you for, um, for projects like Mi Tierra Mia to exist? It's important. It's important in any way to document our present moment. It's important for us to, you know, archive as much as we can, as much history as we can. We are fed um, predominantly American history that is from a white man's perspective. And so La Tierra Mia gives us that insight of, of a world away from the white man, a world against the white man, a world where we fought, where we were fighting against him and and what our history means and um, what we went through, not what the textbook says. Like, or even if there is a textbook entry on Chicano Park, it is, that's not, um, it's just really important for us to make sure that what we've been through and what we see is on the front page rather than um, not on any pages. So that's why Latina Mia is very important to have existed because it, it shows people, it teaches people, and or it reminds people of just how resilient um, black, and, black and brown and indigenous people are, how much we have fought for. Thank you. 
Thank you. And a question from the audience is, have you received any response from the Goya Corporation in response to your photo series? No, I haven't. I honestly wish I did because mm -hmm. that would mean that I've done something more great than I already felt. Um, I, I mean, they are a corporation and I am a, a small photographer. Um, and also knowing that corporations just try to act, you know, like the big brothers, they probably ignore things like this because they invalidate these things and, you know, only, they're only chasing after the bag. They don't remember how, uh, you know, the community it represents feels. They, I don't think they've ever had. Definitely. And um, I guess another one of my questions is what, why did you start like taking pictures to begin with? I guess like like what what pushed you to want to buy that camera in the first place? That's a good question. Um, I've always I've always had a fascination in taking photos. I since I could remember, I even had like a little purple digital camera when I was going tried with that, and you know I just like loved taking photos. That's as simple as simple as I can put it. It's hard to describe where exactly I started. Um, and then also, you know, I'm 21 years old. I grew up in a time where there wasn't any way to share your photos every second of the day. And then all of a sudden you could do that. So then when I got, as I grew older, I had access to that. And so um, that also influenced me a lot. I'm not going to deny it. Just always wanting to take a photo of what was around me. Um, but what was really important to me is um, being personal with my photos. And so I didn't feel that way, you know, with just a phone device. I felt more like that with the camera in hand. So I did have a, like a beginner's Canon. Um, it was gifted to me for my, for Christmas one year when I was younger, tried that out. And, and yeah, just always had, had a liking. And when I saw that at the store, about uh, 17 or 18, um, I was making my own money and I was like, well, let's go for it. Let's figure it out. That's very exciting. And I can't wait to see like your art just growing and growing even more. Um, well, we can give it a couple more minutes and see if anybody in the audience has any more questions. I have a question. Um, it says, are there spaces slash places you'd like to document outside of San Diego? 100%, and I might get emotional talking about this, but um, I was not raised with the privileges of being able to travel around um, anywhere. And for a while, I actually hated San Diego because I was stuck here. I felt like I was stuck here and I couldn't go anywhere. Um, and so I do really want to document places outside of San Diego. I want to document specifically countries in Central America and South America. Um, given that I'm Central American, I have a strong resonation with our culture and I would love to document just really what goes on there. And, um, and then, and yeah, and even venturing out into like LA or any other major city and getting to know their culture, how the disparities between LA or San Francisco's culture and San Diego or the similarities. Um, West Coast culture itself is very unique and I'd love to explore that more and you know, do things that I can do right now amidst the pandemic I do want to do soon. Thank you for that question. And there's also another question in the chat uh, Samia is asking, have you seen or experienced places where you feel represented by your Italian slash Nicaraguan heritage here in SD? Have you, sorry, I'm going to read it real quick. Have you seen yeah, of course. Um, I haven't felt that there's, so for my Italian heritage, 
I haven't felt that it's been represented um, as I enjoy. And I say that because if you're from San Diego, you must be aware of Little Italy, which is the supposed to be the Italian town of San Diego. Um, at this point, it's much uh, bourgeois. It's very much um, uh, high-end Italian restaurants and uh, catering to tourists. So it's not at all, you know, for the Italian community here. Um, but when I was little and when I was growing up and where my mom grew up, Little Italy was uh, was a ghetto and it was full of Italian and Mexican immigrants. And so that's that's where I felt the represent. That's where I felt the representation and where I felt included because a lot of us are really worked alongside with each other, um, with our neighbors, and we knew people down the streets. And I have a best friend today who our families know each other, and we didn't meet through our families. We met at school and. Now there's all these stories of, you know, when so-and-so used to run the street and the other one used to break dance and, um, and just all these things. So that's where I really felt uh, where the Italian community was. It's not so much like that anymore, unfortunately. Um, it's uh, a lot have been displaced, including my family, a uh, poor Italian family. So now we're all kind of spread out. Um, but I hope to, but within, you know, my family and even my best friends were able to kind of still keep that, uh, that feeling of inclusiveness between each other. So that's really nice. And for my Nicaraguan heritage, um, there is very little Central American visibility um, in San Diego and it's rather unfortunate. I think though it has a lot to do with obviously being only 20 minutes from Mexico, there is a much more bigger population of Mexicans here than Central Americans. Or there might be some, there might be a certain population that I don't know about because Central Americans don't often feel comfortable stating that they are Central American, and that's a different discussion. But there is a certain uh, Mexican hegemony towards with their attitudes towards Central Americans. But um, growing up, I've never um, felt that I was being represented, which is why it's very important to me to um, showcase my Central American side. Um, with what I can because uh, for others and um, also just never knowing where to exactly. And that's why Goya Foods was important to me because it had Central American foods. And um, and so I feel like that's also what played a uh, which is why I'm so frustrated with it because Goya did play a big role in making me feel included for sure. Thank you for that question. All right, and if anybody has like any last minute questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, here is our QR code to the art activism survey. And this is just for feedback from y'all so that we can like take it in and uh, like adjust our programs to better fit the community. I'll leave that for a second. And if anybody does have any questions, y'all can go ahead and ask. Or for the light, if there's anything else you want to add on, you can also go ahead and do so. I would just thank you so much for providing me this opportunity. I have never done something like this before. I have never been a featured artist for an art reception before. And so this really, really means a lot. So thank you for providing the space and for working with me beforehand um, to make sure that I could give the best presentation that I could. And I hope that my audience uh, enjoyed it and maybe learn something more about San Diego that maybe you didn't know. Um, and I hope that I rep represented us really well. And if you have anything that you'd like to communicate me to about, you um, could email me um, or hit or hit my Instagram, whatever is appropriate for you. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. So thank you guys. All right, thank you. Um, here is our social media, if y'all wanna like stay up to date with the program, with the programs that we're organizing. Um, it's almost the end of the year. There's not that many programs left, but for next year, there's definitely gonna be a lot more art talks. And thank you for that. I honestly, I learned so much about SD. I had no idea there was like a big Italian, like, I guess like community here. So much to learn. Thank you. I loved your art. Um, thank you. Yeah.
and thanks everyone for coming out and supporting us, supporting